Hello, my name is Mark Watts. I'm a partner here at Bristow's at the IT and Data Protection Group. Uh, in front of me, I have a printout of the regulation or the proposed regulation for data protection that was issued back in January 2012. And in this video, I was proposing just to chat through some of the aspects of this regulation that could be regarded as the accountability principle. Now, the accountability principle, in, in summary, is, is about um, moving data protection from theory to practice, or, or putting it another way, it's about how within a company you bring your data protection compliance to life, and so you don't just have bits of paper and policies and all the rest of it, you actually think about how you achieve compliance as an organization internally. So this phrase, moving data privacy from theory to practice, those are the words of the Article 29 Working Party from their paper in um, July 2010 describing accountability. Now, although we hear a lot about accountability um, these days, it's actually not an entirely new concept and the word accountable or very similar words have appeared in other legal instruments and data protection um, policies and guidelines over the years. So, for example, even the OECD guidelines from 1980, which are effectively the foundation of most data protection around the world, um, they use the word uh, they, they talk about a controller being accountable, so suggesting that there is this idea of accountability. Um, probably the most explicit reference to it that we've seen was the Madrid International Standard of 2009, where they said they talked about controllers having to have the necessary internal mechanisms in place to demonstrate compliance. And, and this idea of demonstrate is very much what accountability is all about. And then in a slightly different context, more thinking about it in terms of data transfers and um, solutions such as binding corporate rules, that would be a very good example of a program, a compliance program, which if done well um, to, sati to satisfy the BCR's requirements could be considered as a form of accountability. Now, one of the reasons why the accountability, accountability has been talked about so much is because of the regulation, as I say. Um, and although the word accountability doesn't appear in the regulation, this is for, for reasons that it wouldn't translate very well into other languages, what the regulation does talk about is the need to implement and demonstrate effective steps. So there's two bits to that. There's the implementing, so doing things, taking steps to achieve compliance, but also being in a position that if asked, you could demonstrate that you have taken these steps. And that's quite a significant difference, because what it means is that when we think about how accountability works in, in legislation, to some extent it changes the nature of a data protection breach altogether. Historically, in order to have a breach, it was necessary for there to be some mishandling or misprocessing of personal data. And if there wasn't, so in the absence of misprocessing, who's to say there was a breach at all? Now where we're, we're moving to um, with accountability is the idea that even if there's no misprocessing, the mere absence of the measures internally or a, a mere inability to demonstrate the existence of those measures, such as policies and procedures, will itself be a breach of the legislation, irrespective of whether anything has gone wrong or not with the underlying data processing. So now, if we just have a, have a think about, well, what are the components of accountability? Because as I say, there's no, um, there's not one particular article in the regulation that says, here's accountability, here's everything you need to do. It's more a strong theme, is perhaps the best way to think about it, that runs through the legislation. And there are various aspects to that. Now, before I go into those, I, I ought to add that this is a proposed regulation. And what we've seen since January um, 2012 is that as part of the normal, uh, the normal legislative process um, in Europe, this has been heavily negotiated and there's been amendments suggested, a significant volume of amendments suggested by the Parliament, um, as well as a number of 
perhaps more business-friendly suggestions being made by uh, as recently as the end of May 2013 by the Irish presidency of the, the council. Now what that means is it's actually rather difficult to say precisely where we will land on accountability but it also seems inconceivable really that as long as the legislation changes which is by no means certain there will be some form of accountability that will in large part implement a number of the things that I'm going to be describing. So the first um, obvious element of accountability is the need to have transparent um, and easily accessible policies. Now th this is very new. At the moment, although it's commonplace for organisations to have data protection policies, in the majority of countries around Europe there isn't actually a legal requirement to do so. Rather, policies are used as a means of achieving their, data, their existing data protection obligations. So in other words, as a way of giving notice to individuals or as a way perhaps of collecting consent. There isn't a law that says you must have a policy. That's going to change under the, under the regulation. There will need to be a policy. It will need to be written in clear, intelligible language. And it will need to be written in a way that makes it fit for purpose for its audience. So, for example, the, well, the, the example that's referenced in the regulation is that if you're collecting information about children, then you should acknowledge that their understanding of some of the words used um, maybe less than, say, uh, a particularly tech-savvy adult, um, and you should tailor the, the language that you use accordingly. So there will need to be policies, is, is the first element um, of accountability I wanted to mention. The second is that we do already have an obligation, uh, or rather data controllers have obligations when they're collecting data to give notice, to notify individuals or to give them fair processing information, to put it another way, describing what is going to be done with their personal data. And typically this would include saying who you are, who's collecting it, so disclosing the, the identity of the data controller, giving some information about the purpose of the processing, so in other words, why you're collecting it, and then anything else, there's a rather vague category, anything else required in order for the processing to be fair, and that could be, for example, um, if there are some non-obvious uses that may be made of the data or if it's going to be shared with third parties that, are, that would be unexpected, then that should also be disclosed to the individual. Now, that notice obligation for this is fairly fundamental in data protection terms um, and so it appears as part of the accountability principle in the proposed regulation. However, what's different is that it becomes longer it becomes more elaborate. So added to that list I just ran through, we also have um, a need to provide the identity and, and de contact details of the data protection officer. And the need to appoint a data protection officer is something that I'll, I'll describe in a moment. Um, as well as that, if, if the processing is based on, say, um, it's necessary because of a contract that's been entered into with the individual, then you would have to identify that contract you'd have to explain what is the processing justification for that particular processing and data collection that you're embarking on as a controller. More difficult still, perhaps, is the need to describe to individuals how long you're going to keep their data for. So what is the retention period for that data? And that's not something that one sees very often at the moment. So as you can see, this list, this list of things that need to be notified will grow if things um, head the way we expect them to head under the regulation. And there's, a, there's a, a few other requirements as well. I don't need to list them all, but um, informing people that they have a right of access to their information, that will become an explicit requirement, as will um, describing to people that they have the right to lodge a complaint in the event that they're unhappy about their data processing. So what does this mean in practice? I think what it means is that we can expect the notices, so the, the language that traditionally might just be two lines at the bottom of a mortgage application form or, or some other form or perhaps at the end of a web form, that's going to need to become a good bit longer. And it also means that, for example, online privacy policies, the checklist for the contents of those is going to grow in order to meet these requirements.
Uh, so moving on, um, another component of the accountability principle, which on the one hand could be regarded as good news, but we will come back to that as to whether it really is good news, um, is the need to maintain internally comprehensive documentation about processing. Now, when you put it like that, it doesn't sound like good news. Where the good news may come in, though, is that this obligation on the controller to keep internal records about the data processing is a replacement, at least at the moment this appears to be where it's heading, a replacement of all of the existing notification requirements with data protection authorities around Europe. So um, anyone who's, who's tried to, uh, for example, notify a, a complex HR processing operation um, and to submit processing notifications with various data protection authorities will know it's actually a, a, a expensive, time-consuming, and some would say relatively futile um, thing to do, but nevertheless it's an existing legal requirement, so companies do try to do it. And it would involve potentially filling out a form, in theory, for each system in each country where that system is located. So it's a, a huge undertaking, potentially, if it's going to be done properly. Now, the good news is that all disappears under the new regulation. The less good news is that there is a way of looking at this that says it's merely being replaced by an internal bureaucracy. In other words, you have to keep the same information. The only difference is that rather than submitting it to data protection authorities now, you have to keep it internally, essentially in some form of register. So um, perhaps mixed news would be the, the best way of describing that. Uh, so moving on, um, one of the other interesting components of the accountability principle that's attracted quite a bit of attention and, and comment is the idea of conducting a privacy impact assessment. Now the idea of doing a privacy impact assessment is is something that one sees already in data protection terms, but more in, in the realms of best practice. So there, there's guidance from, for example, the ICO urging controllers to undertake a PII, PIA in certain situations, um, but it's not a legal requirement as such. Now, under the, the proposed regulation, this would change, and controllers would be required, where they're conducting processing that presents, and, and the language of the regulation is specific risks to conduct a privacy impact assessment. And typically what that would, what that would require would be for the controller to document or describe the processing that's being conducted, to give some thought and to, to work through what might be the risks potentially to individuals, and then to think about, well, firstly, how can those, um, those risks be mitigated? Are they, to the extent there's anything intrusive about the processing, is that justified in the circumstances? And then equally, is there anything that we can do um, in terms of, for example, data security or the way the processing is conducted that would minimise those risks and, um, and safeguard the individual's information? Now, the, um, the concern that's been expressed by some organisations is that essentially what you would have internally would be a document that analyzes and sets out an organization's level of compliance with a legal obligation. And so it would form a perfect paper trail uh, that would potentially be discoverable in litigation, setting out what the organization knew or didn't know about the potential privacy risks involved. Now, th there are a number of ways around that particular concern so that having a privacy impact assessment can be the useful tool rather than potentially harmful tool um, that is intended by the regulation. Now just by way of example of the sort of thing that the regulation cites as potentially presenting specific risks, um, there's various categories, uh, for example, to the extent there is a large database that contains a lot of information about children or genetic information or biometric information. So for example, the sort of databases that's often associated with government and public sector initiatives, that would require a, a formal privacy impact assessment to be conducted. Um, equally, if there's any form of 
large-scale monitoring using audiovisual equipment uh, that's perhaps monitoring the public generally, so for example CCTV, that would require a privacy impact assessment to be conducted, as would processing that involves um, the traditional categories of sensitive personal data, so race, ethnicity, sex life and so on, or for that matter health data or biometric data, um, anything that's being used of, of that nature to reach decisions affecting individuals, um, then if, if it's done on a large scale, then that could trigger um, the need for a privacy impact assessment. And then finally, there is a, a much broader category of examples specified in the regulation, which is really talking about sort of almost and anything else, which involves processing data in an automated way, where you're handling information about the characteristics of an individual, whether it's their um, economic position or their personality or their behavior or whatever it might be and you're making decisions that could have some sort of significant impact or legal impact on them then in that situation the regulation would require the controller to conduct a privacy impact assessment. Um, now I've mentioned already a lot of the internal um, sorry forgive me external paperwork and dealings with data protection authorities around Europe that exists at the moment, whether it's filing notifications or seeking permits and authorizations, a lot of that just disappears. Indeed, nearly all of it disappears. But there can still be situations, just to be clear, where if the conclusion by the controller, um, having done the privacy impact assessment, is that actually this is quite risky processing, then it may be that they will have an obligation to consult with the relevant data protection authority and talk to them about those risks and that processing and to get their view on it. And indeed, if the authority were to take a dim view and not to be persuaded that actually the processing was justified in, in all the circumstances, then the authority has the ability to prohibit the controller from, from performing that data processing. Now, one of the other aspects of um, of accountability that's been quite eye-catching is the requirement on controllers to appoint a data protection officer internally. Now this, this is something we see already in a very small number of countries around, around Europe and Germany is the, is the classic example where for a very long time they've had an obligation um, to appoint a data protection officer internally. Well this now ex would extend to, um, to the whole of, um, of, of Europe, essentially. And for organisations that have either more than 250 people, or which are public authorities, or smaller organisations in the private sector, perhaps, that conduct processing which is itself um, it, it, it risky in some way, that involves the sort of regular and systematic monitoring of people. It may be that if that's your line of business, um, and in other words, privacy and data protection is particularly important to your business, you may find yourself um, nevertheless, despite being small, having to appoint a data protection officer. And the data protection officer, it can't just be anyone. Um, it does need to be someone who's qualified and who has a significant level of expertise in this area. And as with the existing German model, under the regulation, a data protection officer would uh, would um, benefit from a certain amount of employment protection, which, which is to say you couldn't dismiss them from the organisation for reasons other than um, failings perhaps in relation to their data protection obligations. So because they don't like the processing that you're proposing and are potentially not in favour of it, um, that itself would not be um, a reason to remove them from the position. So there's a significant amount of employment protection there, potentially, which is already the case um, in Germany. And then just to, f to finish off on accountability, um, the other components of it that, that again, have, have been widely discussed are what's called privacy by design and privacy by default. And both of these concepts are explicitly included in the regulation. Now, <clears throat> privacy by design is really about encouraging controllers or perhaps requiring controllers to think about how their data processing obligations will comply with the law at the time 
that they are being designed or conceived or put together rather than trying to add a privacy compliance component to a system after it's already been developed, which um, if you've ever tried to do that, you'll know it's actually very difficult often to retrofit the necessary privacy controls onto a system that's been developed without giving any thought to that. So what this looks like in practice is there's, there is, of course, an existing obligation under European law to implement um, appropriate organization, organizational and technical measures in relation to your data processing. <clears throat> we see almost identical wording as the existing requirement, but it's brought forward in time. So it doesn't just refer to when you're processing have appropriate organizational technical measures. It says, it doesn't quite use these words, but it essentially means even when you're, or before you're thinking about, or as you are planning your data processing, you need also to give thought to implementing these organizational and technical measures. In other words, you need to bake in privacy compliance as, as part of the software, as part of the access controls, as part of um, the inherent features in the system. And then finally, on the, on the privacy by default um, aspect of this, what this is referring to is very often um, controllers will develop a system and then they may, there may be a choice. It may be that, um, for example, in a social network, the extent to which information on the social network is made publicly available, that could be something that could be controlled by privacy settings um, under the control of the user. And the view, the view in the regulation um, is that those should be set to the most privacy-friendly settings by default so that for those users, and perhaps this is the majority of users, those users who don't actively think about privacy and how their information is handled and don't actively engage with their privacy settings, then they are nevertheless um, protected, if you like, um, at least as, as required by the, the regulation, um, in the sense that the least intrusive option um, goes through as the default. So that's really a, a summary um, of where we are on, on or, or what the accountability principle is likely to look like. Um, as I say, it may well change, and we see it um, changing back and forth in a, as there is a, essentially a game of tug and war between the, 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 as there's been the Irish presidency making it more business friendly and perhaps the Civil Liberties Committee of the European Parliament making it more stringent. Um, but hopefully that captures the, the, the essence of the principle, and I hope you find that useful.